final week, what that will involve. And so today we will have one hour of my presentation and then we'll have one, uh, sorry, 30 minutes of Q&A. So please write down or hold your questions until after the uh, one hour mark and I'll happily um, do all I can to, to uh, share the information that I earned. All right, welcome. So as I said, today it's hemp, six years of devotion to a plant. So today I'm gonna to be talking about the sales of particular hemp products, because this is really where it began for me. I had purchased these products when I was living in Taiwan and had them shipped to me. And I'm gonna just describe to you exactly what those products were and how uh, I was trained to use them, both as a consumer and then later as somebody who worked in the company. And that those products included, uh, at that time, the shelled hemp seed, also known as hemp hearts. The, um, wow, it's all backwards, it's so funny to, to look backwards. The um, hemp oil, both green and clear. And, <laughs> and hemp flakes and hemp, Something else? What does it say? After hemp flakes? Powder. Hemp powder. Hemp yeah, bars. that's right. Yeah, everything's backwards. It's so crazy. Hemp powder. Yep. Um, hemp bars. That's right. Which were half pound chocolate bar and milk and dark chocolate uh, with um, fruit and nuts as a topping. And uh, what are my bona fides to do this presentation? Um, let's see. Sun, can you share screen? Yep. So if you look at the Wayback Machine, uh, if you do a search on um, hempforest.net, then you'll be able to pick up my website because um, it's no longer a domain that I control. All right. But it does exist. And I also have a, it's still on Facebook too, a Facebook group called hempforest.net. So that's me and that's what I used to have. Next slide, please. All right, so the hemp plant, you know, um, many people have seen it, but um, here's a greater detail. And what I was concerned with when I was working with this plant at that time was predominantly the seeds. And the reason why is because they are the second highest quality protein for human consumption on our, in our realm, on our, our planet. First place goes to mother's milk. So human breast milk is the best source of uh, human digestible protein. Next. So here's a, a photo. Of, um, some of these are they're not very clear. Unfortunately, I, I apologize for that. I might try later on to go through these again, just doing a share screen. And maybe that'll get a, a better detail here. But um, next, next picture. Wow, this is a real um, close up of the shelled hemp seed. And what you see is there's different parts. Of course, in any seed, there are multiple parts to what's um, in that package. And so you have green parts, you have white parts, and there's ways when you're processing these um, um, food materials to, to get it to be whiter or greener, depending on a couple of different things. The guy that I worked with, he used primarily uh, the weight of individual uh, parts. And so, uh, you'll see on my next week's um, presentation, some of the machines he used like gravity tables to sort them. And he had customer feedback of, uh, all the time. And they were like, why is it all so green? <laughs> you know, it's like, it's a, a green plant and uh, it's a plant. So there's going to be green stuff. And they, they wanted like white, white stuff all the time. Next. Well, I, here I was in Taiwan and, uh, you know, why did I get interested in the hemp? Because 
I wanted to leave the country. I wanted to, my wife uh, was Taiwanese and she uh, said, you know, why, if we're going to leave, why don't we go back to Canada? And I'm like, all right, cool. And so I started doing research into Canada. And one of the things I wanted to do was spend time smoking cannabis, which is uh, illegal, like a death penalty or deportation in Taiwan. And so I said, um, yeah, let's, let's check the Canada out. And so I started researching what was being sold in the dispensaries. And one thing that really struck me was this hemp hearts product. I'm like, hemp hearts, what the hell is that? And so I started looking around and I found the company, the company uh, Rocky Mountain Grain Products. And I started reading up on this uh, nutritional thing. I'd been interested in nutrition for most of my life because I lost my best friend to leukemia uh, when I, we were in high school. And so uh, it happened to me. And then I started to trying to start to make connections about nutrition and health and uh, the human body. And so I was really interested because my son was born. And so I was talking with my wife and reading books at that time about fruit. And uh, they were saying, the human brain is so highly developed, possibly because we eat so much fruit and we have this interaction with the plant world, which is the most complex biochemical factories ever known. And so that's why we have these huge brains. And so my wife was already eating a lot of fruit during her pregnancy. And then when I started doing this research into these cool products uh, in the dispensaries, by, mean, by dispensary, I mean like weed shops, which were quasi legal in uh, Canada at that time, which is around 2011. And I was specifically knew that we were going to move to uh, British Columbia and Vancouver. And so I was looking at weed shops or dispensaries. You could think of them as like pharmacies, right? But like it's green leaves and stuff in there instead of like poison pills from big pharma. And so I found this guy's um, company and it was called Rocky Mountain Grain Products. I emailed him, contacted him, and then he sent us a case uh, to Taiwan. And then we blended up with water and turned it into like a baby food for this little ninja guy you see here, my son. So we were using that and it was a real challenge, you know, like I, I I, I, was, I got product information that came with it, and, and the product information says, you should eat about seven tablespoons of this stuff. You should have it with a big bowl of salad, raw fruits and vegetables, maybe a little bit of yogurt, maybe a little bit of cheese. And uh, it was challenging. It was challenging to, to change ev uh, everything I knew, like leave behind like sandwiches, leave behind hamburgers and hot dogs and spaghetti and pasta and carbs and all that crap and, and uh, pizza and french fries and all that stuff. And so it was a long process of changing my diet. And then we got to Vancouver, we, we moved over there. I was like, what am I gonna do for work? And I started talking to the company and he had another, I didn't know at the time, partner, which was some kind of hemp hearts uh, online or hemp hearts, buy hemp hearts, I guess, buy hemp hearts.com that disappeared. And I said to the guy, Roger Snow, I'm like, do you need another company that can market your products? And he's like, oh, okay, I guess you could. And uh, you know, you could um, go around to um, grocery stores and like introduce our products and get them to put it on the shelf. And you could be in a sense, a, a distributor for me. So I was like, yeah, great. I love these products. I love hemp. That's awesome. Let's do it. So we contacted a web developer and he started like giving us mock-ups of these logos. Right. And the company I name I decided on was hempforest.net. So then we started shooting like product videos and product um, uh, shots of like, how, you know, how to use it and um, to describe to people what's going on with it. And so this is the kind of thing that I was eating in 2011. I was eating a shitload of the shelled hemp seed and a whole bunch of fruits and vegetables. And it's, I just, I started to transform me and I fucking loved it. My wife being Chinese and Taiwanese and everything has to be cooked was not so enamored of it. The children were like, as you know, children were like, yeah, sure. Cool. Whatever. Let's do it. And I'll try it. And it's, it's yummy. And it really was. And it was so exciting to, to live it. And that's when I really started to have it in my life every single day. Okay. So here I put some um, product branding of my own. And he actually was kind in the way that he would do labeling for me before he shipped the product to me in Vancouver. And I would get the product and then for free, basically. So this is what would go into the one pound tubs. And so this is the main product. And the very first product I think he ever made was this. And this is what we sold shitloads of. And this is what I was doing. So this is like a one pound container of the shelled hemp seed, best quality. There's other companies that do it, but they don't have the high quality this guy does for various reasons. 
I'll get into the processing again in the next week. And so he um, I had to, as he described it to me, he had to train people first on how to use it. So he created the market, so he says, and I don't really have any information to the contrary. And he contacted, I think initially chiropractors and started sending them a shitload of free samples. He did other things too, like create recipes for like hemp cookies and did a lot of different um, marketing uh, strategies in order to get uh, a market started with uh, the hemp hearts, the hemp products. Okay. So we shipped them in a case of nine one pound containers and that cost like 10 bucks uh, per container. So we'd come to like around like 90 bucks and then $10 shipping if you're in Canada or the United States. Of course, if you were farther away, it would cost more. And then when it comes to things like customs, he had this really clever trick where he would say, um, I'll send you this product. The product costs $1, but the information that I'm giving you costs $90. And so the custom duty taxes would be really low because he was actually selling you something for like $1. And then the other parts of it was just like product information kind of thing. The guy was like a mastermind smuggler. He was so good. We were shipping to Australia, calling it like horse supplements. Sometimes people were actually ordering it for their like racehorses and stuff. And he had various qualities that he could, could ship in various um, sizes, you know, right up to like one ton or like a 20 foot or 40 foot container full of tons of the shelled hemp seed or unshelled, depending on who wanted it and, and for what. So he also did bars and later on, um, my wife was also working for the company and she was doing these bars. So that's a half pound bar inside. It was either milk chocolate or dark chocolate, and they were in different combinations of fruits and nuts. So for example, the dark chocolate was a half pound of dark chocolate with like 55 grams. I'm pretty sure of shelled hemp seed inside and then, um, cherries on top. Like, uh, it was just amazing. So I get up in the morning and then I, do some couple things. I come back home, have my breakfast around 6 a.m. I'd eat my amazing hemp heart salad with um, seven tablespoons of hemp and a whole bunch of fruits and vegetables, some cheese, maybe steamed broccoli and a bit of yogurt. Eat that. So, so between six and lunchtime, I was like, go, go, go. Lots of energy felt fucking really strong. I was moving a lot of like heavy machinery, driving like indoor, outdoor um, forklifts, toting around like um, 24 pound um, pails full of like hemp oil. So moving tons of, of stuff, all kinds of like heavy stuff that I hadn't really done before. I was more of like a, a teacher or, or like a cubicle worker or like an office kind of guy. And so I got to be like, for the first time in my life, a uh, fucking physical manual labor kind of guy. I fucking loved it. And then around lunchtime, my energy level go, mm, take a nosedive. So I grab one of these bars, grab a, like a yogurt, chop up the bar, combine it with the yogurt, mm, eat that up. And that'd be good to go for the next four hours until I finish work. We also sold those bars in the case. And so each bar was like five bucks. And so then there was certain um, configurations and combos that people could order because depending on what uh, what could fit in the box, they would that determine like what combination we, we'd send them. He also developed a unique process to create a clear hemp oil. Now you might think that's no big deal. Well, you know, if people don't want green oil or something that looks green, then you got to come up with something. And so he utilized charcoal and coffee filters to filter uh, the hemp. And he had a very good process that he developed himself. And so as you can see, it was clear hemp oil. And those are like 10, 10 bucks a bottle. I love the hemp oil. I thought it was great. I liked the flavor of it, the taste of it. I got shit loads of it for free when I was working um, with a company uh, directly in Alberta. Because initially, right, I was a distributor in Vancouver, BC. I had a lot of contacts in the supermarkets and grocery stores. I went and got my product or at least introduced because I gave out a lot of free samples to every single dispensary in the Vancouver area. And it had to be Vancouver because the Vancouver police were not um, arresting people or were not interested in cannabis, weed, or dope related um, possession as a, as a criminal charges. But if you got outside the city limits, even if you had like a hemp shop that wasn't actually selling weed, but just had, had like this hemp kind of stuff or like hemp bongs and stuff, then you had all kinds of trouble from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, who were the police force when the city, town, or province doesn't want to have its own police force, then they use the feds. 
And then you see here we have the green hemp oil. I loved it. I would like pour it into um, a pan and start it getting heated up. And then I throw in like popcorn in there and pop popcorn. Like it was people like, ah, what are you doing with that? It's so expensive. Like, no, I get it for free. It tastes great. I love it. Um, there's people who would try and say, oh, it's the nutritional benefits of oil. Really great. Just like cod liver oil. The owner of that company, he would tell them on the phone or whoever asked, he's like, no, it's not. Actually, it doesn't have very much um, benefit to you at all. I don't think that was exactly true. He was just saying that in regards to people thinking that it was a cure-all. A lot of people are looking for fixes or cure-alls, this kind of superpower thing that's going to solve all their problems, right? But that we know that that doesn't really work well because being complex creatures that we are, we require a lot, we have a lot of different inputs and a certain limit of uh, limited outputs, right? But uh, it was useful and, and good in some ways and a, a great lubricant and you could probably, you know, power a diesel uh, engine off of it, but it wasn't this silver bullet thing that some people wanted. I felt that eating the, the hemp hearts and the, the, the full salad was an amazing thing because if you followed his instructions, the slow uh, digestion caused by long, long fiber foods moving slowly through the digestive tract slow down the release and digestion of the shelled hemp seed. And so that way, those two things, which he found because he got tired of shitting his pants and other people <laughs> didn't necessarily want to eat hemp parts and shit their pants either, um, it, that um, it worked well together. And so that, that's how it was done. And that's why he trained people and really encouraged the, um, the fruit and vegetable salad. And he had other products like hemp flakes and hemp powder. So you can make smoothies. Smoothies became a rage way before I ever got there in 2013. But um, he didn't ever promote that because he felt that uh, it was like long fiber, long fibers, um, fruits and vegetables that were required to get the most benefit out of the shelled hemp seed. And I agreed with him and I liked that product because the less processing that's involved in my food, I think is great, right? And so I had all these raw fruits and vegetables and I had this hemp seed all that had been done to it, it was that the shell was knocked off of it. And when the shell was knocked off, goodbye, all the pollution, crap, chemicals, stuff in the air, insect, piss, shit, eggs, whatever was on the, whatever that was happening on the, on the seed itself was all on the exterior. And everything that we wanted anyway was inside. I'll get into how we process this oil from the shelled hemp seed uh, tomorrow when I talk about, uh, sorry, next week when I talk about processing and the machinery we used. Stop talking and click away. We also sold the, the nine bottles in a, in a case, you know, 90 bucks. So what does this say? It says, <laughs> what does it say on here? Can anyone read the side of that? Compressed hemp hearts. How did you that, son? What happened there? Oh. Yeah. Compressed hemp hearts. Thank you. So what kind of things was he doing? So, okay, so it wasn't enough just to create the shelled hemp seed, okay? So we had to, um, he, he wanted to create other products, right? And, and he wanted to capture other markets and different, uh, and, and ride the wave or surf the wave of different trends that were moving in the health food market, but like nutrition in general. Right. There's always new studies coming out and people are taking up different fads. And so he would do things like he had machinery that would we'd pour um, the shell time parts into a gigantic hopper and then an auger would auger it along this heated tube in such a way that there was just there was just enough room for this, this the shell hemp seed to pass through. They would start to get compressed and then it would squeeze out the oil, which would be filtered out and drip down below and down through the hole, the hole in the floor into a gigantic um, barrel, like a plastic barrel thing, industrial like size barrel. And then outcome of, of the end of that corkscrew thing was like this thing that looked like snakes, like green snakes. And um, those are called hemp flakes. And then we might like put them in a chopper or like um, take a <laughs> get this okay he was all about like low cost processing so we'd like have them in gigantic bags right and then we take like an axe blade and pound the fuck out of it and like separate or smash them into like smaller different pieces that way um later on he developed other products too where he created um like cookies and 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 uh, fruit crumbles and all kinds of stuff He was always trying to like create new products that would help people buy this stuff and get the nutritional benefit 
And then those flakes were also ground in this crazy machine. Get this, he made it out of cannon, cannon barrels. I don't have a photo of that, I wish I did. And it processed it into hemp powder. And so my marketing and um, the products that I offered at hempforest.net were like this, right? The one pound tub of the shelled hemp hearts, the half pound chocolate bars in various different um, flavors, clear oil, green oil, and compressed hemp flakes. And then later on, I think too, I was also uh, selling like a hemp powder, but I, I didn't really push those things. I thought everybody should just like get the hemp hearts, the one pound containers and eat them. And that would last you maybe if you ate it like I did every day, maybe five or six days. And so that would be, you know, nine. So I don't know, let's just say one a week. So instead of nine weeks, it'd be like seven weeks, let's say with the nine one pound containers. And that's just one person, you know, if you're a family of four, then you maybe you're eating more. But the thing about it that it was really great was he had done the numbers for the production of this particular food stuff. And he said, if you go to his website, which I'll show you later, one acre of hemp can feed 30 people. One acre of hemp, just from the seeds, can feed 30 people. But that's only their protein requirements. That does not include other things that they may want, like fruits and vegetables, and occasionally meat, right? But he was not a vegan guy. It was not, it was not about that at all. It was just, I'll tell you his story in a little bit if I have time about why he got into this business and why he developed this machinery. So he had some really interesting packaging, I thought, because it showed clearly through the top what the product was, and then he had this stuff on the label. And when I got it in the mail and it arrived and I saw these tubs the first time, I couldn't believe it that anybody would say this stuff in their marketing, in their labeling. When he talked about Health Canada and how they didn't care about people and they were killing people with their bullshit um, labeling of food and their nutrition fact boxes lied to people and that the problems that everyone's having with their health, health are all nutritional related. But he really focused on the mechanical aspects because that was his training. He was trained as a uh, chemical engineer and did a lot of welding and he came from a family, a farming family. And so if you are a farmer yourself or you know farmers, then you know that they have to fix the machinery. They have to do a lot of different things um, to be successful in that market, regardless of what particular thing that they are producing, whether it is a oil seed or it is livestock, chickens, ducks, turkeys, cows, cattle, meat, uh, whatever it is, right? And so um, he had seen from his own life that he went from somebody who could eat like 12 pancakes, sausages and eggs and bacon for breakfast, and then have no energy, even after just immediately eating that, and yet continued to gain weight. So he, I, I never knew him as a big fat guy, but that's what he told me he, he had to struggle with. And he had trouble, he said, climbing up a ladder, he would huff and puff, like halfway getting up the ladder and, and um, hemp uh, changed his life. He, um, he started eating it. And then when he figured out the long fiber of uh, fruits and vegetables part of it, it just started to give him what he never had before uh, or found very sparingly, or perhaps I'd only had as a very young man, like a child, right? Uh, before the body has had to deal with too much stuff and just can't do it anymore, so to speak, and has been hiding away toxic stuff or sludge or whatever it is all over the body for so long that it, uh, it, it becomes noticeable in your belly and your legs or whatever. <laughs> so this is a close up of um, the toppings that was on the um, hemp bar. And um, you uh, and then there's some text there. I don't know. Can can you read that, Mike? Can you see that clearly enough to read? Uh, it's a little bit. I, I I think I can make it out. You want me to try and read the first line? Yeah, yeah. Whatever you can read there. Uh, it, let's see. I think it says, "I." Oh, a. Have a frame of 84 grams of hemp hearts bonded together with 42 grams of European chocolate, each unit co covered with 24 square inches of 
one of the many choice for you for to you that 84 grams of hemp hearts will provide you with sufficient protein and fat that you will experience neither hunger nor weakness for at least six hours. Okay. That is amazing. Thank you so much, Michael Nimitz. Okay. So Welcome. what was this thing and why did he put that on the label? Well, the reason why was this was called more than a square meal bar. That's the name he gave it. He named it because it was a concept thing or like a trick product kind of thing. Okay. He had a money back guarantee. And so he would tell his people, customers or whatever, or I would tell people when I was distributing these products, you eat that bar and I guarantee you will not be hungry for six hours, four hours, something like that. And some people mailed them back. Some, you know, some people wanted a refund, but in, it was such a low percentage, right? But he wanted to make the point. He wanted to do, a, he, he set up some of his, his product and marketing in such a way that he helped convince people the benefits of these things. Because before people were always like laughing about how it was weed, it was marijuana, it was getting you high. I would get that all the time whenever I tell people that I used to do this. They're like, oh, did you get high with eating all that uh, cannabis stuff? Oh. I said, it is physically impossible for you to get high from this product because Health Canada will only permit farmers a license to grow this product if it has 0 0.0001 THC content. Now, there are other varieties of the hemp plant that high, a higher THC content that can be found in the seeds after processing but sometimes but but we we didn't really use them and you get to some knowledge from the farming industry in that people who produce some kind of um, crop or product blend a lot of their product together for various reasons where they might want to adjust or average the quality right they might want to take something that's more expensive and then blend it with something that's cheaper so that they can maximize their margins and so forth right then you take that also into the idea of the organic market. And then you get this thing of like, you know, I certify that you are organic. And that's all it really is, right? Because the machinery that contacts the particular seed or product or whatever, right, may or may not have come in contact with other products that were chemically sprayed. And the land itself may that you say, hey, this, this came from organic, my organic field, my 40, 400, 4,000 acres, whatever. And I never sprayed or hasn't been sprayed in 20 years, but all your machinery is in contact with, with stuff that has been sprayed or has to be sprayed or is part of the Roundup GMO family of fun things that uh, we get from Monsanto, right? So it was, it was about this. And he went to war with Health Canada. These guys hated him because he refused to cower. He refused to get on his knees and beg for forgiveness from the church of government. He hated the government. That's another reason why I like the guy. I couldn't believe, like I told you earlier, that he would put this stuff on his labels. I thought, I've never seen anybody put truth and like nutrition, actual nutrition facts and information and actual true things on there. His products always did what they said they would do. And in fact, I can tell you, he had documented cases of people being cured of cancer. And that was a fucking impressive thing to me at that time in my life, because I knew, you know, that it was like this horrible thing that most people thought was when they heard those words, that was a death sentence. And I was looking for other people like myself who came to understand that nutrition was the key, one of the keys to a good, healthy life and a good quality of life and the ability to do everything or to help your body do whatever you wanted your body to do, whether you were an athlete or you were a uh, teacher or a fireman or a policeman, whatever you were, whatever you were doing, carpenter, you know what I mean? The body will do what you ask it to do, but you got to give it the right inputs. And so that was the focus that I had in my life at this time was nutrition. Okay. So he had different branding and, um, than I did uh, on his products. And uh, we'll take a look at his website in a bit, which is still there. And his product um, and company was Rocky Mountain Grain Products. Later on, he developed this um, uh, standard that he called embryonic, right? It's like, it's better than organic, it's embryonic. Because natural just wasn't good enough for, for the people of North America and the people of 
on the planet. They wanted, uh, if it wasn't organic, then uh, they, they were going to take issue with that. And so we started telling people when I called them on the phone, and that was like mostly um, like uh, Safeway Foods and um, uh, who cares, like big, big, big chains like Costco and stuff like that, that it's better than organic. And we had reasons why. And he would give me a, a scripts to use when we made phone calls to potential buyers. And I would call up and then get the, the name and the email and phone number of the, the buyer and then call back or get the buyer on the phone and then explain this stuff to them tell them how they're going to get a great deal and we're going to send them a whole bunch of cases and this kind of thing. But that came later for me because still we're in the sales kind of uh, stage in my talks in this first of, uh, of three talks. And I was still in the Vancouver area trying to get um, the stuff on the shelves. And I succeeded at that actually, because um, I got one. And when you got the first one, then you know that you can do it and then you can keep going on. Right. And so I got one on um, Commercial Drive in Vancouver at the Dollar Grocers. It was not like a cheap grocer any, by any means. They had a lot of cool stuff in there. But I will never forgive that, forget that, uh, that man for giving me a shot, giving me a chance. And I would do things too. Like I would have um, free samples of the hemp parts in like a little baggies kind of thing with like my business cards um, stapled on the top. And I would go there on Saturdays and like just walk around and like hand them out until I had handed out everything I had. And I did all my marketing and all this stuff on foot. I had a bus pass. <laughs> I went around on the bus because my wife and I at the time, we didn't want to, um, I didn't have a driver's license. I've been out of Canada for like 10 years and we didn't think it was a good use of our money to buy a car. And so <laughs> I would get the products shipped to my place. And then I would just like put them in a backpack and <laughs> carry them around and they get them on the bus. That was crazy. I believe I did that. <laughs> this was his, um, his photo of a really good um, salad for hemp hearts. Okay. And this is what he was showing people. And he was showing that, you know, there's just like things that you commonly find in Canada, right? Like you got lettuce, you got tomatoes, radishes, I think he's got in there, carrots, bean sprouts some um, mulberries, blackberries, mulberries. I, I, my son says blackberries. They're definitely not raspberries, right? He's got some grapes in there, right? All the kind of things that you, you thought was rabbit food. It turns, out, <laughs> it turns out that it's got different trace minerals and elements, right? And your body knows what to do. And you know that's why I really like that uh, chiropractor from the United States, Dr. Tent, I think his name is. A lot of people have heard of him because he talks about um, muscle testing, right? And other people have done that as well. And you find that the body will clearly let you know. It doesn't take an hour or five hours or six days. The body can tell you right away if you start to, to um, listen and, and um, maybe ask questions of your body. Is this good for me? Which thing here is the best for me? This kind of stuff. So this is a photo of uh, an artwork that came from the Hemp Museum. And so while I was going around to the uh, dispensaries in Vancouver, and I knew all of them, and I got to have the fun of going like behind the counter, so to speak, and see like oceans of bud and oceans of weed and all different kinds and um, different products and infused um, caramel corn and gummy bears and chocolate bars and ice cream and... Um, and I used to hang out at the Herb Museum and I had a place um, just as a, outside their door where I had like free samples that I would go and I would refresh their free samples and I'd hang out and talk to the guys working in the Hemp Museum and look at some, some of the things that were in the museum sometimes. And, um, and then also the guy that worked there was like a customer of mine. And so I um, would look at that and you would see in the Hemp Museum that there were products that they would give to chickens or children that had cannabis in them. You know what I mean? There was like one that I remember clearly called Lee's Pecking Medicine. And then you would give drops into your chickens, chicken feed so that chickens wouldn't peck one another to death. So you help the chickens chill out. And there's lots of these products, right? And people would come in, they're like, oh, ah, my gosh, oh my gosh. I never knew there were so many drugs that were sold as products. This is during the time of Canada, you know, when all this stuff was schedule one. It was all illegal and all bad and and, uh, you know, it's all about maintaining their monopoly, the monopoly of the lobbying, uh, you know, creatures, right? The, the big pharma companies who had great deals, whether it was 
you know, Bayer or IG Farben or, or whoever, right? So I made a lot of contacts and I had some success, although my business ultimately failed because some of the people that I was supplying these products to didn't want to pay me. And they first, they asked for deals like, hey, can we pay you a month after we get the shipment? Or can we pay you after all the, all the shipment is sold? Or can we pay you in three months time? You know, and then I, they started dodging me and that led to my decline and got me into trouble because um, I couldn't pay the rent. We, we maxed our credit cards and then we moved to another place. We barely had the rent for that place in North Vancouver. And then we had no money for food, but we had all these hemp products. And so I spiraled into, into um, starvation and then got into trouble. <laughs> Funnily enough, the trouble started right around my birthday in 2013 because I was like, it's my birthday. And I really do wonder, you know, is it true that this cannabis, that this leaf, this pot, this weed can be uh, a, 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 a transfer thing where I can talk to God, that God can talk to me, that God can send messages directly in my brain. And so I went to the dispensary. Um, let me just say something about the dispensary. So before we got to Canada, I was on YouTube and I was watching these videos of a particular guy called the weed guy named Mark, Mark Clokey. And so I knew about him and his family and uh, the dispensary that he had on his family had uh, set up or started on Fraser Street in uh, Vancouver. And that was the first one I went to because I knew about it. I had watched a lot of his videos. And so I walked in there and they said, I hey, do you, uh, have a membership card. I'm like, no, I don't like, OK, do you. Um, you know, can, do you uh, have a, a doctor's note? Have you been to see a doctor? Uh, you know, your MD or your uh, clinic, clinician or, you know, whatever general doctor. I'm like, no, I don't. They're like, would you like a, um, uh, an appointment with our naturopath? I'm like, yes, I would. And they're like, okay, just wait here. We'll see. And she can see you in about 15 minutes. So I went around and then they called my name. I went in there into like a little, <clears throat> so there's like a, a door, you know, by the office that would open up. And then behind that, door was like everything but you wouldn't go there right away right first you'd see the natural path so they open the door i go through into this tiny little room there's just a table and two chairs i sit down and start talking to the natural path and she starts asking me questions it's like well how are you feeling about um uh, this how are you feeling about that you got any aches and pains this kind of thing and i was trying to find things to tell her like i wasn't really very successful at it so she used to start saying to me things like well, I'm kind of trying to find out to see if you have some actually medical problems. That's what I'm really, I, she says, like, I, for example, are you having trouble sleeping? I'm like, oh yes, I am. I'm having trouble sleeping. And uh, she's like, or is there anything else? Are you, you know, how, you told me that you're a new father. Do you find that a little bit stressful having uh, young, young people, uh, you know, babies in the house? I'm like, yes, I do. I'm very stressed out with, with children and, and starting my own business as a hemp, uh, hemp parts distributor. And she's like, okay, great. So she wrote down a prescription and then I took it back out, gave that to the one behind the desk, and then I got a membership. And then I sat down again, and then, then she called my name, and I was like, all right, great. She's like, Lee Rot, here's your card. Let me take your picture. There's a little photo ID thing. Just show me this next time you come in here, and then uh, you go in, go, go shopping. And so the door opened, and I walked through the door, and I walked up to the counter, and I looked down at all that weed, and I felt freedom. I could choose what I ate. I could choose what I would smoke, what would go in my body. I wasn't relegated to fucking cigarettes and alcohol and wine. And you know what I mean? I didn't have to go to the street to get like uh, pills or, or heroin or cocaine or I never did one of that stuff anyway. But I could just go to a store where they had like really high quality products. All the people that worked there were cool. Some of them were hot women. Some of them were, were people that would like go back with you and smoke. And it was, and the prices were really good because there was so much production, so much supply in British Columbia, all those mountains and all those like hippie people and like draft dodgers from the Vietnam era and all these people and mamas and papas and grandmas and grandpas were like growing weeds in their basement. And, and there was just so much of it. And so uh, that's what I did. I went in there and it was like on my birthday. So I was like, I said to them, give me the strongest sativa you've got. I want to know if it's true that God can speak to me if I get really baked. And so they're like, okay, man, look, look, that's what we got. Go for it. Here you go. So I bought like probably like three grams, like 10 bucks a gram. I would always go to and sometimes buy like whatever was on sale for like six, seven bucks a gram, whatever they want to offload quickly, but usually just the best stuff. And then I went home and smoked it. 
And it was like crazy. It just broke me in like into the mental state of, of paranoia. And I started to feel like anxious and I started to worry about things. And that was like around, around the time too that I wasn't eating very well. And so my brain was very sensitive, right? We all know that the human brain can be very uh, fragile, especially in regards to the chemical balances in the brain and what effects that has on our health and our, our ability to, to use or utilize our senses and understand what's, what's happening inside of us and around us. And that basically broke my mind. And then I started to feel that I was being watched, that my life was in danger, that my family was in danger. And it just, again, contributed to my downward spiral. But some of those connections that I made were good. And uh, this particular book, um, The History and Uses of Cannabis Sativa, was written by a friend of mine named Ted. I can't remember his last name. But there was a really good um, hemp shop um, that was um, on the first floor of the Marijuana Party of Canada in Vancouver. And people would show up there all the time trying to score weed, although it was like all over the city. They would just go there because it was kind of famous. And Mark Emery, I don't know if you guys have ever heard of that guy, but he had a business where he would sell and package um, hemp seed, well, weeds, right? Like cannabis, dope, pot, weed, right? And then mail it out to um, people all around the world, most, but mostly to the United States. And he got so popular and so vocal in his um, expressions of what he called freedom and for the use of the hemp plant or the cannabis plant, marijuana plant that he got extradited to the United States and put in jail and prison in uh, Ohio or something like that. Yeah, somewhere for like quite a while. Um, and I didn't think that that was such a good thing because I thought, don't we have a country? Isn't Canada a country? Why the fuck would we expedite this guy? We got all these fucking criminals. We got all these people that run across the border and do all these nasty stuff. This guy who was like paying taxes to Canada. So Canada was making money off of his business was like the Americans were like, we want that guy. And I would talk to like old hippies in the town and ask them about well, what happened with this? What do you guys think about it? And they would say, we fucking hate that Mark Emery guy. You know, it's because of him that we got an office of the DEA in Canada, in our city. Before he got here, everything was chill. Everything was cool. You could just like, no one cared. You could smoke your weed and your joints and, you know, sell it, you know, do whatever you want grow whatever you want. No one really gave a shit. But then he came and opened his big fat mouth and just ruined everything. So that's, that's what they said about him. I never met the man, but some people thought he was a hero. There were some politicians, particularly in the BC NDP party, the National Democratic Party, but kind of like the communist or like the leftist party of Canada um, that were close to him and his organization. And there were a lot of rumors too around Mark Emery and some of the people that were in his circle doing things with like young women and not really so cool and not really so um, mature and professional. But like I said, I never met the man. You know. Next photo. And so some of the places that I worked with um, were on the wrong side of the line, like the hemp shop in uh, on Kingsway in Vancouver. And so they got raided by the RCMP and, and shut down. And so it wasn't like a happy-go-lucky kind of place exactly. Um, depending on where you located your business and the RCMP just wrestles and they just like to go and, and shut businesses down. They weren't really doing any harm. They followed all the rules and regulations. We're not like across the street from a school or a hospital or whatever, but they're just like, Oh, because we can, you know, and because it's still leak illegal federally, you know, even though your province and the whole Canada doesn't really care, you know, it's on the books for the federal laws. And so we want to justify our existence. And so they would go and do that. Um, but I was from Ontario and that was in 2011. I left Ontario in 2001. So in 2000, I was in Toronto, Ontario. And I remember going to hang out at a local coffee shop and people were like rolling joints at the coffee shop and going home, but just like keeping it kind of like on the down low. Um, so we had that kind of freedom before legalization. It's just a matter of what the, the police were instructed to do, whether they were told, this is a priority, get those fuckers, or there was, they were told, just don't worry about it, just leave them alone. It's like a, it's a really low harm kind of thing. So we, in Canada, didn't really have the sense that um, drug war was being used to control uh, certain parts of our, our uh, society. It didn't seem like, uh, get those black guys because they all smoke weed and they're all jazz musicians. It wasn't really like that. It was like, 
the dealers really that were targeted and not the, the casual consumers or the people that had it on in, in low amounts on their person. And um, actually I had a cousin that was a drug dealer for a while, <laughs> but that was before I knew about that. And I never really saw him in business. I just heard stories about him getting in trouble and then put into like um, mental hospital, which is kind of funny because that actually happened to me later on in my life. <laughs> when I left Canada in like 2018, I got to see the inside of a mental institution. Next slide. Is that it? Is there any more? And, you know, I thought Roger Snow was, for me, in a way, he was like kind of a hero in, um, because of his willingness to tussle with the Canadian government. I never saw or have really seen anybody who would go toe to toe with bureaucracy. And he was infamous in those circles and they would send out like health inspectors to look at his operation. And he was clever, man. He would, <laughs> we, would, we would stack crates of boxes and materials and things like that to cover up certain doors, places we didn't want the inspectors to go. Um, or what he did sometimes, he would just put like notices on the door that say, um, this facility is protected by this, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and this kind of thing. If you have a problem, call this number, and the number was a lawyer's number, and, or he wouldn't be there, this kind of stuff. And so he had ways of like preventing them from really hassling him. But he'd been to court and fought his own court battles and also paid lawyers to, to fight some of those battles for him. And so I, I, I really looked up to him and I, I thought, you know, what a great guy. He's got this amazing product, which I will ever be grateful for. And I learned a lot about the hemp product. Um, we're going to get to the Q&A uh, fairly shortly. And I hope that this first installment has been useful to you. I really wanted to take this story uh, in regards to like my own life, my own timeline and give you how I got into this product you know, what I was doing with this product, how I use this product, what it was that we were selling, what we helped to help, how we help, hoped, how we hoped to help people with these products and how it changed their lives. And then I'll get into next week, the processing, how we turn something such as the hemp seed, and I'll even talk about the farming methods a little bit too, um, into these products. And then some of the other machinery, right? And then in the final week, the third installment, I'm going to talk about the fiber, hemp fiber, what that does to machinery, what kind of machinery we needed to, to modify or use just to get the stuff out of the fields. It was challenging, man. That's It's one tough plant. It is, you got to wonder too, if a human being can eat something that's so tough, you know what I mean? It's bound to make you tougher, right? You know what I mean? Like if you're eating wolf steaks as opposed to lamb chops, you know what I mean? Are you going to be tougher than the, the guy who's just eating ice cream and stuff? Sure you are. So um, Roger had a, um, a phrase that I really liked. He liked, he saw it said one time and I wanted to put it on a t-shirt. He said, there is actually only one type of health, tissue health. So what he was saying here was that <clears throat> cancer, leukemia, blah, 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 all these multiple things that they say are wrong with a particular individual all relate to whether the body can maintain the tissues. So if the body can maintain a healthy heart, it will. If the body has whatever it needs to maintain a healthy lung or liver or spleen, it'll just be great and it'll, it'll do that. But when you deprive the body of what it needs or you overload it in some sense that you don't help it rebalance or allow it the time to balance itself, which it will do, then you have conditions that become very obvious, obvious symptoms, and become life-threatening over time, right? There's a doctor named Tommy John, and he said something like, you know, there's people that have died. If they could have only have lived 10 more years, their body would have healed them of whatever was ailing them. It's kind of interesting thing to consider, you know, to think about health and what the body can do. I'm a big fan of Dr. Cassie Huckabee because she says things like, your body is always right. And, um, and the body, your body can heal anything if you want it to. It's going to necessitate, necessitate change, of course, right? So that's why I was 
in love with the, the hemp plant. And for the longest time, I was giving out samples and selling some to my family and friends around the world, telling them, you got to try this stuff. It's amazing. We got a woman that called Roger up and she's like, Roger, can you help me? I've got breast cancer. They want to chop my boob off. And he's like, well, lady, I can't help you, but you got to do exactly what I tell you. She's like, oh, I, 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 I'm desperate. I, I, I probably can do it, but I don't have much money. He's like, don't worry, I got you covered. But I'm telling you, lady, you got to do exactly what I tell you. You got to follow my instructions to the letter, right? And she did. And she sent him two photos. And the first photo, her breast was blackened and it looked like it was covered in tree bark. It was gross. It was, it was pussy and it was splitting. It looked horrible. It didn't look like a breast that a baby or man or woman, anybody would want to have anything to do with, let alone the woman herself, right? And this is the problem people have sometimes. We feel we're betrayed by our bodies. Well, that's the inverse of what's going on, right? We betray our bodies. We betray ourselves. We don't stand up for our own life. We don't take the steps we need to take to have a good quality of life. And we want to blame or something external to us, right? We don't want to admit how much power we have. So anyway, back to the woman's story. She followed his protocol. She ate exactly as he told her to eat. She ate high fiber salads, lots of hemp hearts, and didn't eat the other things that he told her not to eat anymore. You know, I mean, she probably had some of other things that she was used to. It's, it's not easy to change your nutrition, your diet. Everyone should know, knows that. He's tried fad diets, right? So then she sent him another picture of her breast, and it looked as brand new as a baby's bottom, totally fine, things all gone. She went to the doctor, I can't believe it. What happened? It's a miracle, blah, blah, blah. You know, this kind of thing. And I took those photos of this because I had copies of them and showed them to my family. And they didn't give a fuck. They didn't care. Nobody cares. Nobody cared. I couldn't believe it. You know what I mean? For me, it was like miracles. Miracles happen. We've got proof of miracles, folks. Buy this thing and you can have a miracle. And not necessarily was it the hemp thing. It could be other things, right? That's what I learned later on in life that we really do have everything we need wherever we are. You know, the creator and creation is, is not, a, is not a, a, um, a, a joke. It's not a lie and it's not contradictory. We really have been given abundance in every single thing we require, whether that's air, water, land, right? Minerals, plants, animals, right? All over the planet. And that's why we have Eskimos or Inuit who can live in the Arctic. And we have Kalahari Bushmen that can live in the desert because there's life in all directions in this realm. And not only that, but we have, for example, things like spicy foods, hermetics, things to make us vomit if we need to vomit to detoxify or to clear poisons all around this earth. But I can tell you back to the hemp story that at this time, I really thought that it was the silver bullet. It was the thing that everybody needed. And when he told me things like 30, 30 people can be fed of one acre of hemp, I was telling everybody I could tell who would care to listen or I could speak in their direction, world hunger solved today, right? But a lot of us, we know this already, right? Because we know how much of the food that we produce is thrown away in the garbage. It's left to rot or it's poisoned in some way, or it's, uh, you know, um, marketed in some ways that it's not uh, as attractive to people, right? But we all know the truth really is that we, we don't really have a world hunger problem. We have different problems, human problems. Next slide. Is that it? Z? Yeah, give me the Z. Well, Lily, you may be asking, what are you going to talk about next week? Well, next week, I'm going to get into processing. I'm going to tell you about hemp cultivation. How did we grow the plant? What did he have to tell those farmers? He had to train his farmers in the hemp production, right? Uh, I can't read it. Can somebody read it so backwards? Harvesting, seed sorting, shelling, kernel sorting, machinery descriptions, mechanical and vacuum transport systems. And if you uh, storage and uh, kernel process, uh, uh, storage of seeds and kernels, processing machines. Oh, my son figured it out. <laughs> oh, this is so great. Now for next week, I'll be able to read my own slides. Woohoo!
true. <laughs> All right. Hey, everybody. That concludes um, my uh, part of the, the one hour um, introduction to hemp, six years of devotion to a plant, because I lived, breathed, drank, moved, carried, wore hemp clothes all that time. I still would today if it wasn't so illegal in Taiwan. I'd like to open the floor now to Q&A. Um, I know we have an audience of four people. That means three other than, or two, other than Michael and myself, but I don't mind. I'm glad you're here. Thank you. I do have a question. Might be along the lines of uh, maybe your week three or week four um, in the processing more of not, not only the machinery that you're talking about that you'll be covering as far as the raising of the cultivation of the, of the plant, but uh, the breaking down, um, what little I've read about the herd and, and the fibers in hemp, you know, it was a great, it, it is a great paper. It's a great source of many materials that we can use in building. I've been looking at hempcrete, uh, a number of other types of things. And I was wondering if you're going to be able to, if you have knowledge to touch on that and share with them in that in your future lectures. He began focused on nutrition, but later on, like when I left in 2017, he was trying to develop hemp graphene. And so um, for the longest time in, in Canada, whenever the farmers had done processing of hemp in the fields, they were forbidden by law to keep any of the fibers. They were told to burn it, that that was the, the law said, you must burn the fiber, you must burn whatever you're not harvesting for the, the seed. And, but then when I was there, um, we just had, they, they weren't doing that so much anymore. The, the government of the Health Canada and the government seemed to like forget about it, I guess. Um, and the funny thing is too, you know, the government went in ahead and pro, um, put money into like shelling plants and fiber plants and all this stuff so they could tell people, hey, we built you a brand new hemp fiber plant. No production. Hey, we spent millions on this uh, shelling plant no production like what the fuck eh? but that's what they do right that's what those fuckers do they tell everybody hey we're spending your money and blah, blah, blah. But they don't really do that they just get in the way anyway back to your question so he um could get these bales and they were all like massive bales like i call these kind of size of bales like weedabix size you know what i mean like the size the height of a man right so you needed a forklift to to, to fork up like one at a time it's not like the little hay bales that you can toss with one hand, you know, if you're like a manly man, these are like fucking massive, we big size things. Right. And then he developed this machine because what he wanted to do was he knew that um, he needed to get the fibers to a manageable size. And so he created and designed, and then the Mennonites and that worked there, I never got to learn welding for whatever reason, but the Mennonites did all the welding created what he called, what I called the chopper. So what it was, was a huge um, steel uh, tank, right? He always worked in steel. He was always building things to last, right? And he had a shitload of like machinery that he pulled out of the United States when they decommissioned various um, food processing plants. And some of this machinery is so massive, nobody wanted to take it out of there, but he would go down the States, rip the get, rip this stuff out and just take it all home and just leave it in his field. So whenever he decides some design some machinery, he had almost everything that he needed in the back 40, just sitting out there. And he'd like, I think there's one of those gravity tables over there. And then we go out looking for it. We drive around in our trucks and pickups to go pick it up or tractors and pick it up and drag it back to the shop or get it in a crane. Anyway, so the, back to the, the chopper. And so it was like a, a gigantic um, a steel, like water tank, whatever, some kind of tank, right? And then he, we chopped that in half and then they welded on triangular look like gigantic steel shark teeth like fucking hundreds of them like it just took weeks to build and these guys like welded them on one by one and so then he put that on this gigantic gearbox he had he had a couple of these things and this gearbox was massive it was about um so if i lie down on the ground like six feet in diameter let's say and that thing was like really heavy duty so it was it was designed to to have like a, a huge amount of torque and very strong and build, able to turn something, right? It was not a high speed uh, kind of um, thing at all. It was like a low, low power, high torque thing. So we had it mounted on that. And then he created like a long steel, always steel. They welded together like a long ramp so that the bales could go in the top or be dropped in the top. And then they would roll down toward the fucking chopper going around like this, spinning around to like um, 
start to cut the, the hay bales, like shred, basically shred the, the, these bales of hemp, right? So I was there when all these things were being tested. It was so fascinating because, you know, I got tired of doing the other things. Right? And so I saw what, you, what they had, and then they would move it up there. And the thing would get to the chopper, and it would just stand there. And the chopper would turn and turn and start, start chewing. And then it would, like, start winding the hemp fiber around the fucking drum, around the fucking teeth. It would go around and then be like, <laughs> and then we couldn't handle it anymore. And then it was like, so it was his design, but again, this plant is fucking tough. And then what we would end up doing would be like, we'd take chainsaws and we'd like chop the bale up and then we'd try to shove it in there. And then we'd like have it on pitchforks and like push it against the fucking chopper to like get the chopper to like start to eat away at the little bit of the, the hemp bale that it would take. And, and then, then we, we ended up doing so many things manually. Then we had to like pull all the fucking fibers off the chopper. You know what, obviously when it was turned off, okay? Like these fucking, he, his whole thing too was like, we never got danger pay. But every job of that company was fucking dangerous. It was so exciting and so thrilling. When I get into the processing, especially when we um, build a, the secondary um, seed processing plant out of containers, he stacked up five containers high, welded them together, welded steel, steel floors between them, and then we put the machinery in. You, it's just amazing what this guy was doing and what we were doing. It was crazy. Up and down these steel stairs. Oh, it's crazy, man. Crazy. In the wintertime, fucking freezing. We had all these, like, heaters and fans with like uh, propane in them. They're going to blow us all the fucking keep me calm. It was crazy. I, I loved working there. It was just, it was fucking an adventure. Anyway, so then we were like manually kicking these fibers out and he was doing it, but on a very limited scale. He really wanted, you know, just like anything else, he wanted to process in such a way that it's like a process and forget kind of thing where it would just, everything worked really well. He also had this strategy for all his machining whereby he might do it like incrementally, like a little bit at a time all, every day. But if you leave these machines on and he maintained that all food processing machinery is really meant to run continuously. It's not meant to run from like nine to five and then shut down for a break or it's meant to run like 24 hours, seven days a week. And a lot of the food processing around the world, according to Roger Snow was actually done that way. And it works best that way. When you start shopping, shutting things down, especially things that get like hot and cold, and you get condensation. And when you get condensation, you got water. And when you got water, you got life. And when everything starts growing in there and then you got mold and bacteria and all kinds of stuff that people tend not to like in, in their food, right? Like moldy cheese. And I got photos. I got photos of like, I got photos of some of the stuff I cleaned. And it was like loaves of mold. Anyway. Hey, you don't change the photo. So then what we did was, so we got the fibers out and it was just like, you'd imagine like flaxing wool. And so you had like thicker stemmy kind of stuff and like lighter, thinner kind of stuff. And um, he wasn't really in interested in what we knew from the emperor's uh, has no clothes. Like um, what's that Jack, whatever that books, I can't remember that guy's book name, but he talked about how they had decorticators. He wasn't doing that. He wasn't interested in that. He just wanted to take the whole bale turn it into fibers. So then we take those things and then we put them into this another like um, gigantic steel um, cylinder that it was on the back of a, a like a, a tra tractor trailer, right? It was like a cement truck you could imagine, right? And then we shoved it in there and then I was sealed and then it would cook those fibers inside there without burning them. And so they were carbonized, uh, right? Because when we took them out, it was like graphene form, but they weren't like burned you know what i mean he want he was doing it with like high heat without without flame kind of processing does that answer your question <laughs> partially and you've also got me uh, um interested in learning welding <laughs> yeah right yeah right uh, being it's able a, to fabricate some of this I, i'm 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 interested in the benefits of the plant in its its material properties is you know that that some of the usages that the stories that I had always heard was, for example, the um, who was the uh, paper baron, um, but the, Hearst. That, Hearst, um, that some of that was shut down uh, political again. Yeah, um, you know, not not so much that not even the uh, the THC side of it, but just all the uses of it for the the fiber, for the paper, for the building material. The Model T, the first uh, Henry Ford's car was built of it and ran on on biofuel, if I'm not mistaken which may also have come from the hemp product. We were also supposed to supply people that wanted the hemp fiber to put into plastic pellets for um, injection molding and for auto parts. But I, I never came to anything. It's so fucking crazy. It's so weird. 
you know, you, when you start to get involved with certain projects or you start to, to observe what happens around some really good ideas, or some really motivated people, you really do see how government just fucks shit up. Like, for example, I was talking with um, Native elders and I said, you know, what's going on in your reserve? You know, I mean, what, what's going on with you guys? He's like, Lee, we, we, we're just we're like we're in poverty. We, what do you think is going on? It's all the same kind of shit. I'm like, well, haven't you guys ever wanted to, like, have your own businesses and like, you know, you, surely you, you're, you and your people are very motivated to do this kind of thing. He's like, Lee, we've done this so many times. We had a L, LED manufacturer come. We had the people trained. We had the money. We had the funding. We had everything. And the government just fucked it all up and wouldn't let us, wouldn't let us break the, the cycle of poverty. And so that's the story. That's the story that we all have. With, you know what I mean? The, the government did that, and especially with these hemp products. What's going on with hemp now in, in, in Canada? Well, you know, it's the licenses are only granted to big producers and the, the fad seems to have gone. People aren't even talking about it anymore. Like, you know, I mean, nobody seems to care. What is really in the, con in the consciousness? Well, it was COVID, but before COVID, it was like free um, uh, bud and leaf for everybody, right? What about all the people that had terminal conditions that were using it as a medicine? Well, the government basically said, fuck all y'all. We're going to make sure that we give it to the, the kids that want to get high and stone and party. And they literally did that. They made they fucked up the supply. They cut out all the dispensaries, made them all go for licensing. And you get no licensing if you had a criminal record or anyone who was working there in the past. All these hurdles, right? They just get in the way and interfere with all these great businesses and ideas and things that were very successful. All these great supply chains. Like I told you, the weed was so cheap. The cannabis, the leaf was so cheap in, in Vancouver because everybody was growing it. Everyone was getting a good price. And the biker gangs or whoever was doing the protection side of things was like keeping it all flowing it was great but get government involved you know that story so did that answer your question about the fiber when it comes to the fiber too you know like he his farmers were growing these hemp plants that were like the size of a bush so like knee high the hemp plant can grow like six seven feet tall right you've seen photos i never got to see a field where that that he was telling me about it was like growing like a jungle when i saw fields like just north of where we lived like acres and acres of it and it all just like looked like berry bushes, right? And I was like, why is that? Well, it's because the combines couldn't, couldn't lift up, right? So we always wanted to use them, you know, like any other human being, you want to use what you got. And so the wheat combines, we had all that machinery because Alberta and Canada has like vast uh, cultivation areas of, of uh, wheat. And so all those machinery were, were designed for a certain height of plant. And so it couldn't raise itself very well to harvest higher hemp plants. So, you know, and that was a challenge too, because the hemp plant would get all wound up in the combine machinery too. It was like a freaking hassle. You can't, can you really imagine? It's so amazing that this plant, that's a, a plant, it's a fiber. It can be made into paper. It's like, you would think it's weaker than a tree, but it can bust a steel machinery easily because it just it, it, it gets a situation going where it binds it and wraps it up. It's the power of a rope or a net, right? Yeah, it it's been used for rope rope or you know it was used quite heavily for rope as well as, as and long as well fibers as, it's such that's like phenomenally long fibers yeah the other thing i didn't do while i was there that i really wanted to do was try this um thing called the sea of green where you take the plant the leaves and the stalk and all that stuff not the bud and the and the seeds so much and you put it through like a grinder and you grind it up so it becomes juiced and you drink it I read there's some doctor in the United States that was had patients and like, it's great. There's so many phytochemicals in there. That's the one thing I never tried. I tried almost everything else at the hemp plant except that particular thing. Well, I'm thank you very much. I'm interested in um, I mean more one questions. Of the things, yeah. <laughs> See if go on, go on, questions. go on. Go on. Please go ahead. Sorry, right, I'm I, excited. I, I've got some questions. You yes. Uh, first of all and this is probably next week's as well, but uh, uh, we talked a little bit about different kinds of seed and stuff like that. Uh, I've definitely been interested in hemp for a while and I've got into a couple different projects, but there's a, a great deal of different kinds of seed depending on the location, you know, that work better in different soil and temperature conditions and stuff like that. Are you aware of any of that kind of stuff? Did he get into any of that kind of stuff when he was looking for the seeds that worked for him and where he was at? I heard, he told me this guy loved to talk. And I, I, I don't know, I've always liked asking questions. And I, I, I told you, I idolized him. I love that man up until he started being an asshole I couldn't tolerate. 
And so he told me that he had been in contact with people in Russia. So during the Soviet era, they had created a lot of different farming communes and they had seed stocks all over the country. And some of them were still in existence. And there were people who were like seed hunters, not just the weed hunters, right? Like those guys on YouTube that were going around looking for different strains in like Africa or Mali or South Africa or Jamaica. But there are people doing that also for different other products, right? And some of them were hemp. And so he sourced some of that stuff because he was looking for very particular varieties. He came from a farming family. He also told me things such as Southern Alberta is a very dry climate in comparison with um, Manitoba. Now there's a company in Canada called Manitoba Harvest and they also were producing uh, hemp seed for a while. Although they didn't seem to be so concerned with shelling the hemp seed before they sold it to people, they would just do a minimal job, so to speak. And so you get all this like grindy, gritty kind of sandy shit in your mouth. Not like this beautiful, uh, beautiful, pure uh, shelled hemp seed there with no shells or anything in it, right, that he had. And so he told me that wet areas have problems. And so if they were producing their hemp and then they chopped it down and let the seeds mature on the ground, it would uptake E. coli or other things or mold and stuff like that. He trained his farmers to harvest it standing up, just like the weed, uh, sorry, wheat combines would go through a field, right? And so they were trained to wait for the seeds to start to drop and it was all about moisture. The other thing he told me was that, in answer to your question, Michael, was that because of the dry climate of Southern Alberta, we had a higher protein content in wheat and probably other um, products as well. And that's when we did a lot of, uh, we processed a lot. And we had, we had producers coming in from different parts of the country, like some from Manitoba, some from Alberta, just up the street from where we lived, um, some in other parts of the province. And so we had a very good comparison. We had ability to look and see how did, what's the quality of this particular truckload? And they came in super bees, right? Do you know what super bees are? Like, uh, like truck trail, tractor trailers, right? Okay. So you would have three trains or like the, the, the cab and then like two or three um, seed. Um, <laughs> how do you explain this? No. Um, carrying it's, things. It's, it's one trailer, but it's got like a cone shape, right? Exactly. I don't know yeah. how to like trailers, trailers. That's what they are. There's like the, the cab and then two or three trailers full of seed. Yeah. And then at the bottom, there's like a um, hopper that we yeah. pull and then we we'd pack up the um, auger underneath it. And that would auger it up to dump into the silo, which he called yeah. something else. I can't remember that, what they fucking called those things there. Anyway, I had fun doing that, too. And so um, we saw a lot of different uh, variety and quality. And then once we took delivery and he would only order and, and sign contract with farmers that would follow his instructions or that he had trained or were willing to, to, to follow what he had. He, Cause what happens with the hemp, if it's too moist, it starts to stink. It's a really amazing thing, but God damn, you know what I mean? You've never smelled anything that like that stink. Like when it gets wet, it just, and so if, if you were processing it and, and the hemp seed was too wet, um, then it would have mold and it would start to smell bad. And then you could never get, get rid of that, that smell. So if you had the right uh, content or you, you lowered the moisture so that it was kept dry and he and we welded massive fans into the bottom of his silos and we'd turn these things on and this fucking thing would go and sh sh force air up through all this, all the seed that was in the silo. And sometimes if the fan was too hot, it'd be blowing fucking seeds out the top of that. It was amazing. And so he had floors that would permit air to flow through there which sometimes, which not sometimes, caused a lot of seed to fall through the cracks, so to speak, and get under there. And I had the job one, one, one month of going through and shoveling literally all that shit out. I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to clean this all up because there's always water. Because he had these, he had a concrete pad where his silos were on and those fuckers that built the concrete pad did not do it correctly with an angle so water would draw off. We had all these fucking puddles of fire. oh it's horrible man it would just you know in the winters too covered in ice and snow and then you know when the rain would come and then we have water sitting down there boy you never squeegeed as much water as i have squeegeed fucking oceans of water man off of those fucking concrete pods and i would go in there and like scoop it all this shit out and then so there's a little like a opening underneath the silo that your man could hunch under to get in and i shovel it up and then hunch out and dump it into fucking the bucket of the tractor and then go back in and does that answer your question? And so 
keeping it dry. And his way of drying it and checking it out was by weight. He was always like, there's always a simple way to, to, to measure these things. And so he'd get this, the size that he want, he'd weigh it, put it in the microwave, like cook it basically until it was like lighter. Then he'd come out and he'd check the weight of it again. And then he might tell the guys, put it through this hand, hand shelling thing. Let's taste it and see how it tastes. And this is go through and like, this is good. And so that, that's how he was finding out his content. And then we were also going into the silos all the time. That was fucking fun. Climbing up the side of the silo in a ladder, get to the part of the silo where there's like a metal ladder, drag up a metal fucking chain ladder, take it up to the top of the silo, hook it on, drop it, climb down into the silo. You know how dangerous that is? You know, people die and they suffocate in those fucking grain silos. <laughs> Nobody died when I was there, but it was fucking crazy. Do that in the winter with the fucking ice and snow on the top of the silo. I tell you, it was fucking nuts. It was nuts with the things that we did. He would ask us to do it. It was like nothing to him. And the reason why was because he grew up on a farm. He told me one time they were ranchers and his father told him, I want you to go across the river and get those fucking cows. And he looked at his father and he knew his father was trying to kill him. And so he had no problem giving us all these like fucking things to do. Right. Cause he, he knew that what, what the risks were, all this, all this kind of stuff. He was like, oh, just, does that answer your question? I Indeed. love these stories. All right. Uh, you mess. You, uh, I got a couple other questions, one on muscle testing, but also on the, like the free samples and like stimulating demand. When you first started and you were giving out uh, free samples, could you talk a little bit about how that, how that translated into demand like were you giving it out to like actual customers of the the stores and then this the, you getting them to ask the store for for uh, the product or what i would take free samples into the stores and supermarkets myself and give them the product and let them try it and, and convince them you know like uh how to do it how to use it and try it out themselves so that they would know what it was about we would also give really good deals and um, like give them their first case free or this kind of thing. I'd also say to them, not only will I help you get it on the shelf and also come by and check and restock for you and you can, you, you know, I'll come and check it. You don't have to just call me. I'll come by, but I'll also come in on weekends and hand out free samples to your customers to like introduce the product, this kind of thing. Now, what did I find was that some of them guys were like really cool about it and they're really behind it and they believed in it and it was a good thing. Other people, most of the owners of the supermarkets, especially when you get into corporations, they just didn't give a fuck. I had a, um, a supermarket and the customers in there were telling me, I love this product. It's great. I don't know why he doesn't stock it anymore. I'm like, what are you talking about? And they're like, I asked him, I told him I wanted to buy it. I told him I'd buy it. I've been buying it for years, but he just doesn't care and he wouldn't stock it. I couldn't believe that. I thought surely you got a business surely you're going to provide what the people are asking you for surely that you're going to stock the things that people want and the things that they're paying money for well they just they just don't they don't give a shit they don't care you know especially when you get into supermarket chains there's that company that wasn't paying me and i told the fucking guy i'm like i am a single guy i have a, a wife and two children this is my business this is all i do this sustains my family it matters and that means that i'm going to be here and I'm going to take care of the guy didn't give a fuck, man. You didn't pay me. He would dodge me. I'd show up. They're like, oh, he's, he, he'll be back in an hour. They were all asked to lie at the supermarket. He came from like one of the wealthiest families in that city, in that part of the Canada. And they had multiple supermarkets all around. His cousin had another one, Sunny Valley uh, Fruit and Vegetable. And she was amazing. I would go in there. She liked to see me. I was always looking for places that had fruits and vegetables because hey, that's what we wanted people to eat. That's what people were there buying. It seemed like a win-win to me. Like, hey, you know, you got this amazing product. You got all the other things that we need. They work together. It's like peanut butter and jam. Let's go. But they just, a lot of the people didn't, you know what I mean? And then uh, anyway. And so then later when I got to Alberta, he was like laughing at me. He's like, you didn't really get any success. You didn't really make any sales. I'm like, buddy, I have lists of like supermarkets, every single dispensary in the, in the city. I did that all by myself. Sure, you, your product had to get to me. And then I did things too, back to your samples question. I was standing at like Grand Central Station giving out free samples until like the, grand, the, the, the transit cops come up to me and like, hey, you can't do that here. So then I'd walk away and then I come back in like 20 minutes and like I'd stand there again. All these people. And I, I was on the transit all the time. So I knew where the high uh, travel areas were and people would just like loved it. Like who doesn't like free stuff? So people were just walking by, grabbing it and they had my business card on there. I got very few sales from that. 
I don't know what it was. Like I told you, when I got back to uh, uh, Alberta later on after trouble with the police and going to prison and all this stuff and carjacking because I was starving and all that stuff, he was laughing at me. He's like, <laughs> you know, Lee, I can have a little old lady call up a whole bunch of distributors and I can get, you know, 20 sales in, in one hour. And I'm thinking to myself, why did you ask me to do that then? Why did you ask me to go to all those supermarkets? Why did you think it was such a great idea? I called you up week after week telling you, I don't know if I can do this anymore, man. It's not really um, providing for my family. I'm sorry I haven't been sending you the money from the sales. I'm using that money to buy food for my wife and two children. I, I, you know, I'm trying my best. And he would just convince me to keep going. I'm convinced that he did that to break me and to break my family. Because later on, he tried to sleep with my wife and he was real happy to get me in the situation where I was a slave and working at his company in Southern Alberta. So you don't, you don't do that unless you want to get someone in a situation where they'll do whatever you say. And he really wanted a kingdom. So that's what he was about, but I learned a lot. So <laughs> in regard to uh, giving out free samples and stuff like that, the, the, the better strategy was then to, to like use the businesses, right? Or, or, I mean, of all the things that you did, which one was the best? The most effective was when I was later on, after I've done working all different kinds of um, tasks in his operation, I did everything except for like oil, putting, bottling the oils, but I did everything else. Shelling the hemp seed, making the chocolate bars, making the cookies, putting in packages, doing sample boxes out of wood, filling them up with all the samples of our products, um, doing the shipping from our shipping center thing all around the world in uh, Canada, United States. But the most effective marketing plan was, just as he told me when he was laughing at me when I got to Alberta, was that you sat someone in, in front of a phone, you gave them phone numbers to call, and they called up these places and they got the, the buyers on the phone, and then he got the number and, and address, and we sent supplies to them. And then we had to quickly follow up once they got those supplies or those samples to see if they were happy with it, whoever they gave them away to whether or not they were going to order from us. And we had to do that in large volume. And that was effective. And that worked. He really broke his market open by going after the chiropractors because they were willing to take on this health food nutritional product. And they were not afraid of Health Canada. And Health Canada wasn't sending inspectors to chiropractors. Who would have thought yeah. to send health food inspectors to like a chiropractor pro office, right? But the chiropractors also didn't weren't plugged into the allopathic medicine model. And so they were willing to take on like real science and nutrition as a way to heal people. And so they were interested in that and they were happy to do that. He had long-term relationships with that. Things got really fucked up because he stopped caring. For, I don't know why he stopped caring about his customer base. And so one of the last jobs I did was going through his room of paper folders and going through them and looking for people that had an order from us in a year's time and telling him, we got something, we got a great deal for you. You're going to get it at six bucks a pound instead of 10. So a great savings, and we'll send you like 10, 20, 30 cases, whatever you want. And if you, you get uh, 20 cases or up to 100 cases, we'll get you a really good deal, this kind of thing. And I was doing that right up until the day that um, his office bitch got pissed at me and, and called him up and screamed at the Roger. And then Roger called up and screamed at me for 20 minutes, and then I had enough. <laughs> muscle testing. You talked about muscle testing in regard to, uh, you know, like what's good food. Could you explain that just a little better? I saw, um, because I believe Tim Flynn was sharing videos of Dr. Tent, that he had a video of him in his chiropractor off, chiropractory office, and he showed that there was a woman that came in, and he told her, put your finger in this yogurt, and then her other arm would be strong or not, and that was the muscle testing that I saw, and so I felt that there's a lot going on with the body and its ability to give us the information that we require in a very short time frame. It doesn't take 20 years to figure out that the yogurt you're eating is fucking you up. Although the symptoms sure. and the doctors that have been trained to like, like Dr. Cassie Huckabee says, they got like a long list and they just check the fucking boxes. Do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? Do you have this? Are you seeing this? Do you have signs of it? Okay, it must be this. That's all they do. It has nothing to do with what do you eat? How do you exercise? Where do you sleep? What's on the other wall from the side of where you sleep? Is it like a, like say, for example, a refrigerator motor that's going all this time and fucking up your electromagnetic system? None of that shit comes into it at all. And then they'll ask about like, what do you have a history of in your family? What kind of foods did your mother eat? Did your father eat? Did your grandparents eat? Did you have a history of this in your family? None of that kind of stuff, right? So, but that's fine. You know what I mean? This is just opportunities for us to 
to short circuit their bullshit and quickly get to what's effective for us. And we know all of us in this room know that we've seen many different meetings and many different podcasts and presentations where people have found out a lot of the truth in regards to nutrition. And basically it comes down to you eat what sustains your life and your body and your body will start to communicate very quickly with what's going on. And, but if you're willing to listen to that, then you're going to have a great quality of life. If you're not willing to listen to that, then your body's going to keep trying to chug along chug, 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 until it can anymore. And, there's a, and then it just starts to fall apart. But if we, like, I love that hemp stuff, man. I, I, I would be eating it today. It became my, my life. I really, like when six years of devotion to the plant is actual fact. I literally ate it, drank it, slept it, breathed it. When I was in the shelling plant, the dust was around all the time. You know, the dust alone from the processing the, the shells, right? The moving the shells around, the grain around itself creates this kind of very fine particle dust that it would be in the air and they would settle down on top of this machinery, on top of like steel platforms. And that shit would harden into like some kind of epoxy shit. I'd be up there with like a putty knife <clears throat> trying to clean it off. And then I like get a corner of it off and I'll be like, oh, right on. Then I could get under it and I'd scrape it off. And then I'd be like, he's like, oh boy, I guess you found something to do because there was only enough um, time, uh, only enough um, product to shell for like the first six hours of the day. So I needed something to do for the other two hours. And I was not a fuck around guy. I was always like looking for things. I was always the guy that would just pick up a broom. You know, I had to, I changed a little bit from when I got there. I was like a very soft handed kind of guy and I became much more fit and muscular. And I, man, I fucking loved it. It was great. I, the body felt so great doing that kind of work. It was amazing. But then very soon after, Whatever I'd clean would be covered in dust and shit all over again, you know? It's just, uh, yeah. And then that dust would also be, be shunted up to the roof. And he had in the rafters this out, outlay where the dust would come out from like the processing, not just the dust that was floating around, but he had a, the way the system at that time was set up to have the dust outputted in this particular box that would fill up. And to get that fucking box up, okay, somebody had to climb up a ladder up the side of the building, open this uh, door uh, in the rafters, climb in there, and then um, the forklift would raise up, just barely could reach up to that level, the outdoor forklift on big fucking pontoon tires, right? Pick up this box and then forklift it out of there. And that thing was always full of like water and shit. It was the stink that would come out of that thing. It was, just, I'd never smelled anything like that before. But what was that? It was life, lots of life. It was like soil in, in its start to process any of these things. They generate a shitload of byproducts. That's why people have wealth. That's why they destroyed farmers. That's why they, want, they don't want people to have their own businesses and stuff like that, to be actually processing real things because you can't help but become wealthy, especially if you're, you're minding your pennies, right? That's why people now like homesteading and stuff do microgreens and chickens does that answer your question <laughs> yeah well you know the uh, the last thing i'll mention is is uh you know you talked about jurisdiction and like vancouver versus outside of vancouver and then also you're talking about ontario and different places where people you know nobody got screwed with versus other places where people got screwed with and to me that suggests Close that window on the left this idea of jurisdiction is something that Same. people pay attention to. And certainly the people that enforce the law pay attention to. That's, that's definitely something to keep in mind. You know, when it, we're going into a, if people are going into the kind of this kind of business, th this is kind of one of those things where we've got to keep in mind, like who's got the jurisdiction that's going to be a, a big thing as far as, you know, people kicking in your doors and saying that nah, you can't do this or all your supplies. We just take, we're taking them. Well, I think also the grammar and definitions of the words. Um, so much of law is about the terminology. So when it's kind of like, as Lee was saying earlier about the gentleman's uh, customs maneuvers of getting things through customs for different pay um, brilliant yes, ratings brilliant. but the same kind of thing i think comes up in law if, if we can catalog is using the right terminology to show that this is not covered by that statute or it's protected by that statute because we use the right terminology i think those are you know playing that game playing their game to win Indeed. 
Yeah, there's a reason why lawyers look for loopholes, right? Because they exist. It's like a Swiss cheese. And because there's just so many rules and regulations that no living person knows them all, it's, it's, it's not possible. <laughs> Highly improbable. Yeah, my, my final thing is, Lee, I, I absolutely enjoyed your presentation. I, I thought it was stellar. I mean, I, I really liked everything that you put put together there. I like the way that you brought the energy to it. Uh, it flowed incredibly well. So uh, hats off, man. Just excellent, excellent presentation. Thank you. Please come here. Okay, question. Excellent. Yeah, go ahead. Keen is... is uh... Michael Nimitz and, and Lee, um, I think that that uh, is isn't that also called kinesthesiology, the testing of muscle strength with different substances held against. Well, kinesiology is not the science of movement, and it's a kinesiologist is someone who studies the movement of the human body. I don't know if it pertains exactly to the muscle testing, though. Yeah, you're right. That wording makes a lot more sense that way. Thank you. This is then, the guy that started it all. This is my son. He's now 11 years old. His name's Aku. It's because of him that we were making um, hemp milk, which Roger thought was a stupid idea. He's like, you should just be giving him the hemp and let the baby suck on it or bite on it or ground it up in his little mouth. Don't be like trying to make it into a milk, the blah, 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 he was saying. But we didn't know. We, we just were trying to make it, you know, like a fruity drink for him. So we were doing that. And he seemed to like it. <laughs> yeah. What's your question? No. Do you have a question? I have a question now. No, no. Okay. <laughs> if you remember your question, let me know. Any other questions? I love questions. You know, it yeah. was just hey, it hey, was Lee. just so amazing. Yeah, go ahead, Bobby. Hi. Hi. Yeah, I, I know we've spoken about this before, but this has been great to see your full, you know, uh presentation with the, the backdrops and the props. And yeah, just in particular the one behind you, hemp forest. What what is uh, did you cover that? What 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 the meaning of that is? This is the name I, I gave my company. Uh, I called my company Hemp Forest. If um, hey, uh, if you go to the archive, the Wayback Machine, you can find hempforest.net, and that was uh, my website. So I was in um, Vancouver, and we had a website. And we had no license from the government, nothing like that. We, I was so excited. My wife put in all her retirement from the Canadian Taiwanese army money into it. And we bought a, a web developer guy who did this um, uh, mock-ups of logos and things for us and then set up the, um, the cart on the website so people could order from that. But they didn't really like doing that. What, what, where were my sales generated by? My sales were generated by mostly the grocery stores. And I... Um, and I would go in there and people have my website and stuff all the time. I had to, even now the hemp forest is on Facebook and you can see there all the stuff that I did where I went to the train station where I would go to Google maps and show people on Google maps where all of my locations were. And I could tell all these, these um, retailers exactly what the prices were across the whole city. I'm like, this guy's selling it for nine bucks. This guy's selling it for 10 bucks. I said, between you and me, if I were you, I'd sell it for nine bucks because you're gonna get it for eight bucks a pound. You'll make only a buck on each pound on each tub, but then you're gonna sell a lot more. Oh, no, 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 no. we're gonna sell it at 10 bucks. Oh, we're gonna sell it at 12 bucks. We're gonna sell it at 18 bucks. I'm like, and they wouldn't sell. It wouldn't, they wouldn't move. No, we would fucking buy it. I would tell the people, the guys at the stores this, but they didn't give a fuck about it. And then there were people too, it was like, uh, I go in there, has it sold yet? I was always looking for money. <laughs> you know, they had the product. I had to put it on the shelves. I delivered it. And I was like, always getting, trying to get paid. It was such a freaking hassle. But then um, also too, I was like um, getting calls sometimes from people like they were just buying it themselves. I would show up at, at a cafe or meet them at a Starbucks or something. And I'd have their order with them. So I was like hand delivering stuff. I had this one guy who got this huge order of bars and stuff with me. And then when he came to pay me, he tried to grab me and, and like, I don't know, steal the money back or beat me or rape me. Or I don't know what this guy was doing, but he was a muscular construction guy. I ran out of there and got back away from like this park where we we're hanging out, smoking a joint and, and got back onto like the main street and was walking fast. And he was like, follow me. It was bizarre. The kind of stuff that I went through. I couldn't believe you wouldn't believe the stuff that I went through when I was trying to have a business in there. I ultimately failed as a businessman, as a distributor. Right. But, um, I learned a lot about how not to do business. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting. I've, I've been following the hemp industry since my early teens. And uh, 
kind of, you know, for, for about eight years since I was 14, it, it kind of went into the background, but I was always, I always, I, I found this shirt when I was a teenager at a head shop that said, you can make everything out of hemp. And it had, uh, you know, food, fuel, fiber, and, you know, the cars, and it was all, it was all pictograms. And so I've been following that and, and your story of working with Roger. And I remember you telling me that he just kind of uh, fell into growing hemp by happenstance. Can you want to go over that a little bit? Sure. I, I'd love to. Okay. By the way, so this is my thing. I came up with this and I love the logo. Um, at the beginning of my presentation, I showed you the, the web designer uh, artist guy gave us like a mock-ups of like about nine different logos. Hey, Oh, my son, you're so, so genius. Thank you, son. And so I chose the leaf. I thought, I'm not going to hide that this is the plant. I thought, I'm proud of it. I'm proud of that this is the plant. But Roger, he's like, what's, the, what's your problem? That's a big problem. You're all so hot, closely aligned with a whole bunch of dope smoking idiots in Vancouver and the head shops and the, and the weed dispensaries, you know, oh, blah, blah. Later on, so that was like 2011, no, 2013, 2014, I got in trouble about 2000, 2013, I got in trouble. So 2011, 2013, let's say, okay. When I left his company in 2017, he was putting the fucking leaf on his products and his fucking labeling and all that shit. He thought it was a great idea, you know, for them, you know, you know, this is what people do all the time. Oh, you're an idiot. And then later on, oh, what a great idea. You know, this is this kind of stuff, right? But anyway, how did he get into it? So he built machines. He had taken a lot of machinery out of food processing, processing plants in the United States. He was located very close to the southern the border of southern Alberta. So the United States was very close there. And so he had a company where they would call him up and ask him to rip this machinery out if he couldn't fix it. Oftentimes he was in the cleaning up awful buckets, like you know what awful are, right? Like guts and intestines, that's like dirty jobs and shit, right? So then he had all this machinery that he would rip out. So he got a reputation for that. Then there was something that happened in Canada with regulation and the Canadian government told farmers, hemp's a great product. Why don't you try growing it? See what you can do with it and go for it. And so they did. And then they ended up growing it. And then they had this, they were looking at their products that they could make with it or do with it. And there isn't much machinery at that time, I think, to processing fiber. So it could very well be that they were encouraged to buy, to grow it for the, the seed properties. Who knows? Maybe the government was listening to somebody and they wanted to study this thing and they wanted other people to pay for it. I don't know really how that happened. But the farmers came to him and said, we've got this product. Nobody wants to buy it. Um, the government is not helping us or subsidizing it. What can you do with it? Can you make us a shelling machine? So he designed a shelling machine. Machine. Then it was shelling. What, year, it was, what year was this? I really don't know. Let's go so, to the website, hemphearts.com. Maybe uh, it's there. The and so that happened and then they came back to him and they're like well we don't really want it he's like well do you want your hemp seed back and they're like no yeah okay you can just keep that sample you got there he's like okay then one day he was hungry and he like ate it and he shit his pants and then he's like trying to figure out how to combine it or what why that was and he's like well i'm a mechanic i understand machinery what's going on here it's an oil plant it's an oil seed plant it's probably too much lubrication how can i change that highly lubricating situation to my benefit? What could I do with it or eat with it, combine with it, so that it would not be too much lubrication? Although it does cure constipation. To this day, in Chinese traditional medicine, it's prescribed as a um, anti-constipation uh, food, food stuff. So we combine it with long fiber foods. And then it was amazing. That's when it all started to click and it started to make him feel great. He lost weight. He got his strength back. His health came back. His tissues rebounded because the body was getting all this high quality protein that it could turn into, if not energy, including the fats, which your, the brain needs, into wonderful tissues, heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, all that stuff. That's why he had this thing that the only true health that matters is tissue health. If your tissues can be in good shape, your health will be no problem. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it was more just that he, uh, the, the Canadian government getting, he got wind of the Canadian government giving uh, 
incentives to grow hemp to the farmers and the farmers were growing the seeds and then they they that's, had that's they said. had they had the product and there's like nobody wanted it they didn't know how to package this is in alberta because i know there's the other guy out there i forget his name right now but i met uh hemp oil canada he was one of the one yeah. of the early pioneers and then the guy you mentioned manitoba hemp hearts i met i met manitoba him Harvest. i met him in in san francisco back in 2009 or 10 and he was uh you know really just getting going with manitoba hemp parts but from you know i didn't really follow where they are i think they're still in the the game right they were uh, bought by americans oh yeah so rogers thing looks like i just was checking it out uh on on his website it looks like he's really pioneering some new food products are you following what he's doing still? Not really. I just sometimes go there and see if his website is still up. And like I, I gave away, I had like, like a 28 pound diagnosed with terminal cancer just before I left Canada. I told him, you know, you and your wife should be eating this and this is how you should eat it. And you won't have cancer. I don't know if he survived or if he ever started eating it, but that's the last I had of, actually, that's not true. I came back to Taiwan and then I couldn't find a job right away. And so I was telling Roger, Hey, maybe you can uh, send me some products here and I'll find health food stores in Taiwan. Doll, Cause I couldn't help myself. I loved eating hemp products. And so I had access to all these hemp products that people weren't buying. I just freaking ate them because like I, it was just so ingrained. It was like delicious. He made these like um, crumbles that he made with like oats and nuts and like it would, they were great. And they had like a lot of um, hemp protein and hemp flakes in them. And I was eating them with yogurt. You know, I was just like, I just I couldn't help it. I was just like, it's such a good thing for breakfast. And uh, this is like after six, seven years of eating it every day, I just, I just couldn't go back to eating like bacon and eggs and toast. I just, until it was all gone, I ate it all. It was just, and then it was, that was it. I wish I could get it again. I want to grow it here in Taiwan. I think if I, I, I would know how to approach the, the local authorities, and I wouldn't give up. And I would find a way to, to get a community supporting me, and I would make sure that everybody knows that I'm growing food. I'm not growing drugs. But the police here are always trumpeting stories of you know, busting this guy with like five plants. We caught this American. He's an ABC. American born Chinese. We got him with five plants. He's a drug dealer. We got him. We got him. <laughs> and so they, and that's what you see on the website of the Taipei police. Yep. See that. Any other questions? No. All right. Uh, can, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I, I want to. Just get a layout of you. You're doing six presentations or four presentations. How many presentations are you doing? I'm doing three presentations of one hour plus um, half an hour of Q and A, and so the second one is going to cover processing, and the third one will cover fiber and stories and um, descriptions of fiber, and then maybe I'll do like some drawings of the machinery, like the chopper, and uh, and stuff like that. I kind of gave away some of that stuff already. So that might be a light presentation in week three. So it's three presentations each each uh, a week, separated by a week. Um, I got some photos I should, could show you of uh, some of those machinery, just like to tease you a bit. Let's see. Oh my gosh, it's the wrong thing. Maybe in week three, we can also discuss that. Uh, product that the powder that you were having to chisel off that sounds a little bit intriguing like there's another product idea there well that's that's kind of that plastic uh, you know part yeah this is one of my big interests in hemp is all the stuff you can make from the byproducts uh, this is a gravity table so it's like using the gravity to sort um, particular pieces of the product based on weight so that top this is, piece this, vibrates? This is, this is something right. Roger invented? He 
really liked telling people that he had invented things and that he had been the originator of things. But I learned working with him that he had taken machinery and other people's work and designs and modified it. But that doesn't mean that when he was so he was innovating. He was more of an innovator than an inventor, I would say. Yeah, the, the machines weren't designed to uh, sift or harvest or, or process hemp, but he modified them to make them process the hemp plant better. And here's a really good example of this. Does anyone know what this machine is? Looks like car air cleaner, some of it. I know exactly what it is because I got it from searching for the company. This is a Sueco, okay, made by the Sueco company, S-W-E-C-O. So what happens is whatever is dumped into here, this whole thing shakes and vibrates. It's another type of gravity table, okay? And inside here, you got a big shaking machine, and this is the base. We bolted that to steel floors, okay? <laughs> Although you could bolt it to concrete floor probably. And, um, and then what will happen is, depending on the screens that you have in here, it can sort. And we had like three different layers of this, right? And so you have like, you see here is the outspout. And then you have here, hoses would be attached here that could channel whatever product you want down to another floor, another table, gravity table, right? And so we had screens that were custom made for us by the welders, or we would order them from the Sueco company and they would have openings of various sizes. So we could sort for the size of kernel that we wanted. And then we could direct those kernels where we wanted them. In this particular installation of this, this particular machine, and I think, he, oh, I know you had two of them, one on either side. The inside, the incoming seed was on one side and that was designed, this Sueco was there to remove like bits of sticks and bugs and, and stones and gravel and that kind of stuff so that we clean the seed on the one side of the factory. The other side of the shelling plant was processing the shelled hemp seed. And so we had screens there to sort the different sizes. And then they had three tubes that would go down and dump onto the gravity table that I showed you earlier. Yeah, I look forward to that. It was crazy. Yeah, so you have a lot more machines to go through about what, what, what was being used? Well, I just grabbed a couple of photos, you know, get this just to like have a little teaser kind of thing for next week. Yeah, that's one of them. It's an amazing machine. And can you guess what this machine was designed to do? The Swaco machine, this machine I just told you about. It was designed for mining. And what does it do? It sifts. It's basically a gigantic sieve or sifter, right? It's a, it's a, it's designed to sift concrete so that they can get concrete powder rather than like chunky and stuff like that for like, that's what I was told. You have to look up the company, I guess, and maybe I'm wrong, but that's what he said to me. And so that's what this dude did. Like I said, he would repurpose machinery. It was amazing. It was amazing. People would come and, and take tours of his shelling plant. Some from India, some from Germany. They're always trying to come and steal his secrets, he said, and like wanted to see his operation so they could replicate it. Yeah. It was so fascinating. It was such a fascinating place to work. Good stuff, Lee. Well done. Thank you. Took me a while, but I'm going to make use of it. My Thank you for the presentation. I appreciate it. I learned a lot, too. Thank you. That's so sweet. Thank you so much for saying that. I appreciate that. A real great deal. <laughs> And I kind of wish Gleister was here because he made me promise to do this presentation that I talked about various times, but I guess he couldn't make it. That's fine. I, Michael, you've helped me out with the recording. Thank you so much, Michael Nimitz. And thank you My for player. all of you that attended. Great presentation. I liked all the F-bombs. <laughs> So shall we cut the recording and then you did already. Thank you so much.